Following the media, it may seem as if a military confrontation between US and China is unavoidable. But it's still such a daunting prospect that no one can really be sure how it would unravel. If the US and China do go to war, such a conflict might last not months, but years. And in those years, how much would industrial output help decide the war's outcome? What sort of industrial output could the two sides even count on? This video will try to cover all that, explore each side's industrial potential when it comes to ships, aircraft and missiles. It will also look into the US ability to blockade China and perform strikes on Chinese industry. Are oil, iron ore or semiconductors China's Achilles heel? The video will explore all those questions and try to provide some sort of an answer. The US fighting China would mostly come down to control of the seas around China and Japan. Some of those saw some heavy battles in World War II. Today's sponsor World of Warships lets you play with exactly those battleships, cruisers and other ships of World War II. You can command massive naval fleets composed of history's most iconic warships. Destroyers and battleships, sure, but also aircraft carriers and submarines. Subs are new to the game and I've played those the most lately. You can play with friends or, like me, as a lone wolf. That sort of plays well with submarines. I feel like I'm a close quarters sniper on an ambush. World of Warships releases new content every month, ships, cosmetic items or new gameplay. And there are some fierce battles to be fought. Imagine 12v12 player arenas with battleships everywhere. It all looks epic. A look at these water effects and textures. Weather is dynamically simulated, so a map is never the same. And there are over 40 different maps included. Check out World of Warships for free, but if you use my link in the description below, you'll get 500 doubloons, 1.5 million credits, a choice of a free ship after you complete 10 battles, and 7 days of premium time if you use the code BRAVO via my link. The offer is applicable to new users only. Oh, and console lovers, World of Warships is available for consoles as well. Binkov believes the war would be confined to one mostly on the sea and in the air, but that it would still last for years. Reasons for that may be explored by another video, as this is gonna be long as it is. There is always potential for the industry to make many more weapons than it's making today. Of course, scaling up production takes time. For smaller things like artillery ammo, that can double within a year and a half, as we saw in Ukraine. If it was a do-or-die war for the US itself, it would probably take even less. Missiles may take longer, but there are conflicting examples. In 2023, the US decided to double Javelin missile production. But doubling itself will be reached by 2026. Again, in a war against China, ramp-up would be quicker. There is the example of the German Iris T anti-air missile. Its manufacturer said that production was tripled during a single year in 2023 and that another doubling of production would come in 2024. It's hard to give a precise answer as different systems and manufacturers have different bottlenecks. Still, it's unlikely missile production would shoot up five times within just the first year. But if masses of new workers start training and many new production lines and subcontractors come online in 2024, then by 2026 there might be some serious increase in capacity. We're talking not just doubling or tripling, but perhaps even order of magnitude more stuff. World War II examples also sort of show that. Tanks and planes were complex systems back then, and the entire US economy and industry was mobilized to pump out as much stuff as quickly as possible. Ramp-ups of various vehicles show that. A ramp-up of aircraft wasn't as impressive, percentage-wise. While vehicles managed to increase 4 to 11 times in a year, Aircraft production increased roughly three times in a year, before leveling off a bit. That's not because aircraft were inherently much more complex than tanks. It's because the industrial capacity in aerospace was not as developed as in the automotive industry. When the US started arming itself for World War II, it had many car maker firms, making millions of cars in 1941. And those firms switched much of their workforce to combat vehicles. Actually, cars for civilians simply ceased to be made from February 1942 as the government commandeered production. It wasn't until 1946 that civilian production resumed. And even then, it needed a few years to reach the 1941 levels. 
Back then, automakers switched and made some planes alongside tanks. Most of the time, it was the manufacture of certain parts or even complete engines, but Ford, General Motors, Chrysler and others also made complete planes. Today, in a US versus China war, it would not be tanks and vehicles that would be needed in massive numbers. Aircraft engines and missile motors today are much more different than what current automakers make. Gasoline engine in a car is worlds apart from a modern gas turbine in a plane, helicopter or even a cruise missile. The car industry would not switch to missiles and planes nearly as quickly nor easily as it did in World War II. Also, today's car production lines are in good part populated with custom-designed robots. Those would often not be able to be used on vastly different projects. The workforce in the US car industry has remained steady over the decades. Direct comparisons of employees and vehicles produced are not possible, as employees include those for various car parts and seasonal layoffs. What is perhaps a better show of the overall manufacturing trend is how many people worked in manufacturing of any kind in the US. The 1940 to 1943 figure skyrocketed due to war needs. Then it came down and peaked in 1979. Today it's not that much off from the pre war 1940. And that's despite the US population rising two and a half times during that period. Percentage-wise, far fewer people work in US manufacturing nowadays. Compared to that, China's manufacturing has steadily risen over the decades, until 2019 when it started dropping. To date, has just over 100 million people working in manufacturing, compared to 13 million in the US. But how does all that impact actual war? Would China outproduce the US? That depends on which area. For example, US commercial shipbuilding is almost dead. It can't really help make military ships quickly like in World War II. But China has leveraged its industrial capacity to aid its military shipbuilding boom. As our previous videos showed, China has been making a bigger tonnage of warships than the US for some time now. Unlike the US, China could make even more ships, dipping more into its commercial shipbuilding capacity. Any increase on the US side would take longer, as whole new workforces would need to be trained and shipyards built. But it is doable. Just recently, shipbuilder Austal USA announced an expansion, more construction halls, and an increase in its workforce from 3 to 5,000 workers in two years. Taking another two years to actually build a ship, it all means ships can't be easily and quickly added over the existing shipbuilding capacity. The US Navy would try to expand its control closer to China's shores, but after enough losses that would not longer be plausible. The US would know it can't replenish its naval fleets and that it would need to save up many ships for air defense and economic blockade of China. Today, with the starting capacity being so low, it's unlikely the US could ramp up its warship production quickly. Maybe destroyer production could be doubled within four years or so, if push comes to shove. China has launched 10 destroyers in 2019. Separate shipyards launched four frigates within a year. Current Chinese ship orders are not as high, but the capacity is there. There's another important factor to consider. US shipbuilding would be done far, far away from the threat zone. Sure, sabotage is always possible, but Chinese shipyards would also be subjected to actual airstrikes. Those are forward based on the coast. China has six shipyards where pretty much all its combat ships, assault ships, carriers and submarines are made. Two of those are right next to each other in Shanghai. Two more are fairly exposed as well. Those four make all the surface ships for the Chinese Navy. It's only the two submarine makers, one in Hulidao and other at Wuhan inland, which are more protected from missile strikes due to their position and probable ample air defenses on the way. So despite China having the capacity of making new ships quickly, it's questionable just how many of those shipyards would keep functioning as US missile and airstrikes keep interfering with their work. What would be harder to damage during the war would be aircraft factories. Some of those facilities are so far inland that they would see fairly few attacks. Others closer to US forces or delivery points of US aircraft might see their production quite curtailed, like Shenyang's facilities up north. Unlike the US, China makes but a few dozen commercial airliners. 
In theory, their makers could switch to wartime production, just like US Boeing facilities would, but China's facilities are located around Shanghai, making them very susceptible to attacks. China today likely makes some 160 combat planes per year. Their export plane capacities account for just a dozen or two planes, unlike US ones, which account for over a third of the US baseline figure. Lacking a big commercial plane sector, China's second year would add little and would keep suffering from a small base until several years into the war. The US could ramp up to higher numbers once it converts its Boeing airliner lines to work on combat jets. We actually made a video on that exact topic. China's missile production facilities are numerous and not well documented, but given the smaller footprint, those could likely be more easily relocated inland. Aircraft makers too could relocate in theory, though every relocation of lines means periods of no production, which is sensitive in a war. Six months could easily be needed to relocate machinery, even in war-expedited circumstances. Missiles and various drones would of course be of utmost importance in a war in the skies and over the sea. There is sadly simply no information on how many missiles of which kind does China make. Even the missile inventories are basically just guesstimates. But the underlying manufacturing base does favor China. We know that China since 2012 launched or added 69 ships with medium or long-range SAMs. Each is roughly equivalent to one or two SAM batteries. In the same time period, China added almost 100 medium and long-range ground-based SAM batteries, in addition to ones for export. So it's plausible China today can add 17 or more medium or long-range SAM batteries each year, with the corresponding missile inventory. Whether those figures could be doubled in a year, two years or three years, that's harder to say. US SAM production is somewhat higher than DoD production shown here, but not by much. Legacy Patriot missiles will also be produced in Europe soon. Actual deliveries lag procurement years by roughly two years. Comparing cruise missiles and ballistic missile production is simply not possible, as there is no data coming from China. Given the number of launch platforms added in the last 15 years, one can assume at least 250 missiles per year for China, but it could easily be a few times higher than that. Numbers shown are for US procurement only, and exports do add to those figures. For example, Tomahawks for Japan add 130 missiles per year, capacity-wise. China's production of cruise and ballistic missiles may or may not be currently higher than the US one, but given the bigger industrial base, it's plausible China might increase such missile production more quickly than the US. Perhaps more dangerous for the US would be simple and cheap piston-engine-driven munitions, sort of like Iran's Shahid kamikaze drones. Those aren't cheap FPV drones, but munitions costing a few tens of thousands of dollars. While there were no such drones shown in China before the war in Ukraine, their simplicity is such that Chinese industry can potentially make thousands per month after months of production line setup. Scooter makers could help make piston engine missiles. Shahid's engines were allegedly sourced from China anyway. The US too is trying to leverage the commercial sector to make thousands of drone munitions as well. We made a video on that too. But given China's manufacturing advantage, it's plausible China might far surpass US figures there. What remains a bigger question is just how useful would hundreds of such simple and slow munitions be. So China is likely to go on the defensive in early stages of the war, due to US advantage in planes, ships and missiles. But soon that US advantage might melt away, at which point Chinese industrial output advantage might mean more missiles and munitions for China. Possibly some more ships and subs, though that's harder to say. Certainly not initially, until the US runs out of most missiles to harass China's shipyards with. After some years, US advantage in aircraft numbers would again start appearing. Though if the US presses into China, local numbers might again not favor the US due to sortie rates and distance woes. Another important issue for China, much more than for the US, is economic impact on industrial output. Factories may be there, workers may be there, but what if raw materials aren't there? What if the money isn't there due to a massive financial crisis? 
To be sure, if the US and China went to war, the whole world would see a financial crisis on such a scale that would make both the 2009 crisis and the 1920s Great Depression seem like child's play. But China would be affected disproportionately more. It's not just that China relies on 20% of its GDP through export, but that export and trade overall is in large part done via ships. More precisely, between 65 and 95% of China's trade is via shipping lanes, depending on whether you look at total tonnage or total value. Once a war starts, China would be more or less unable to rely on shipping lanes for anything. One of the main US Navy goals would be to establish a blockade on all ships going to or leaving China. While that would be a mammoth task, a hammer-like take-no-prisoners approach could largely pull it off, even if it angers many neutral countries in the process. China is already geographically fairly boxed in, with much of maritime trade going through several choke points. That would impact the overall world's trade, of course but ships blockaded to and from China would still be done. And China would likely lose two-thirds of its export and import GDP nearly overnight, thus seemingly shrinking its overall GDP by 25%. Of course, consumption and GDP adjustments would start happening right after that, so GDP would rebound somewhat. More trade would be done with immediate neighbors, via rail and road, though capacity increases would be fairly small. But China's problems would not end there. China imports a lot of raw materials that can't be easily replaced or redistributed. Chinese dependency on imports of fossil fuels is considerable. In 2022, China produced 30% of the oil it consumed. With natural gas, it's better off. It produced 58% of its consumption needs in 2023. Of course, not all of those imports are done via ships. More precisely, after accounting for land routes, China would be some 50% short on oil and 36% short on natural gas. All that would have no immediate impact on China's military. Compared to the entire economy, the whole military consumes only a fraction of fuel. With the military-related industry as well, immediate impact would be negligible. With 50-74% to oil and gas needs covered, military-related industry could chug along for years. It's the overall industry and economy that would suffer. Personal transportation would be first to be hit. No gas for private cars. That alone would likely save the lion's share of oil for the economy. But people are part of the economy. No cars means more time to reach workplaces, less work efficiency. So the economy would suffer further. It's not just oil and gas, though. China is a huge importer of iron ore, and almost all of it comes via the sea. Russia, Kazakhstan and Iran made some 200 million tons of iron ore in 2022. Even if China paid premium prices to somehow get half of that via land routes, it would only somewhat alleviate iron woes, with China likely still being some 55% short on iron ore needs, compared to pre-war era. Again, for the military, that would make no difference. 0.7 billion cubic meters of iron a year is enough to produce anything the military might desire. Today, semiconductors are more important than steel, though exact figures are harder to come by. Semiconductor imports into China kept rising until 2021. How much of that is due to overall shrinkage in the world's market and how much of it is due to China's added semiconductor capacity is hard to say. China makes 16% of the world's integrated circuits. It imports a lot more, but the majority of all those circuits are then re-exported as part of other products. So actual domestic consumption of semiconductors in China is hard to gauge. Once again though, the 16% production alone is enough to cover immediate military needs. While smartphones and similar electronics benefit from high-end chips, like 3 or 5 nanometer ones, most other products are competitive enough with far older and less efficient chips. Appliances, controllers in cars and so on, those are all 14 or 28 nanometer chips, or even older. And the military is even worse. Development times for military products sometimes take a whole decade. The F-35 fighter jet entered service with a main processing unit, which was some six generations behind commercial use cutting edge. 
but that was fine as it was optimized to do fewer tasks well and be reliable. Microprocessors and missiles and sensors are even more specialized to do just one thing, so even old large chips can be used. Again, the ability to make thousands of smart munitions and sensors a year would be there. It's the broader economy in China that would suffer. For the first few years, China would likely go on chugging along. Russia proved that even massive sanctions can't really kill an economy as markets and goods simply tend to get redistributed. But Russia has China and India as big players still trading with it. China might find itself in a place where fewer countries trade with it. US, Japan, Australia, Canada, Taiwan, UK, likely Mexico as well. Those would probably not trade with China from the start. Saudis, India, Africa, EU, Latin America, those might want to trade, but maritime entry to and from China might be policed by the US, by force. So China might be down to Russia, Central Asia, its immediate land neighbors to its south, and whatever trade it can master via rail to Europe. It would not be a negligible total, but it might still be only a third of pre-war totals. That would be quite hard to redistribute and compensate for, as remaining countries simply don't have the volume of market to plug in the gaps. If that goes on for years, and the war very well might, in the long run China might find itself in a tricky situation. Militarily it would be able to defend itself, but years of economic pressure might start internal dissent, leading to a ceasefire, even if not all immediate goals like control over Taiwan are achieved. Basically the timeline of the war would see a curve, where both US and China's military power would drop due to the start of the war. Over the years, both sides would increase their military output. China would likely see their curve rise more steeply in the first few years. China might be able to use that advantage to take some territories. That's far from assured, of course. And at a certain point, as US attacks on fuel and electricity production continue, the economic woes and market access woes would pressure China more than the US. China's industrial output advantage and eight times more workers in manufacturing, those would diminish. To what extent, that's hard to say. But it's possible that the US might, in a multi-year war, regain the industrial output edge when its allies are included. The outcome might be a world divided, with a ceasefire eventually put in place and China alongside certain Central Asia countries locked into its own economic ecosystem, while the rest of the world goes on in a separate ecosystem. There would always be some basic trade between them, but China's industrial output will likely be past its highest point, achieved today. Of course, no one can predict even 5, let alone 10 years into the future. So political infighting might change the predictions laid out in this video by quite a bit. And don't forget about World of Warships and their offer. Use my link below the video and you'll get 500 doubloons, 1.5 million credits, a choice of a free ship after you complete 10 battles, and 7 days of premium time if you use the code BRAVO via my link. The offer is applicable to new users only. And remember, Binkov may talk about war, but only real peace can bring us all together.